They say that history is written by the victors. But it doesn't mean the other side of the story is forgotten. There were a series of wars across the continent. There's a myth that Aboriginal people didn't fight back. Aboriginal people start to fight fire with fire. They were under attack all the time, and yet they went on. They're our heroes. This story deserves to be remembered. The Australian Wars starts Wednesday, 21st of September on SBS and NITV. On SBS, SBS On Demand at NITV is a new docuseries called The Australian Wars. It explores the hidden history of our colonisation, more specifically the wave of violent domination and destruction of the Indigenous people over the first 100 years, a genocidal sweep of the land that has been ignored in white Australia's account of our first century. It is the work of uh, our national treasure, Rachel Perkins. And I'm so happy to have her on screen watching this morning. Nice to talk to you, Rachel. Uh, nice to nice to be here. I'm not sure I'm a national treasure, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, embrace it, embrace it, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, congratulations on this remarkable series. Um, staggering numbers come out of this show. Um, approximately 72,000 Indigenous people killed in Queensland alone, 400-odd massacres, thousands of women and children murdered. Before you even get into the detail of what these numbers represent, um, the stats are, are truly staggering. How have they remained hidden for so long? What sort of effort mu must that have taken? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that at the time that these wars were occurring across Australia, they were very much spoken about as wars, you know, by Europeans mm. um, in newspapers, letters, you know, they were, there was a great awareness that this was what was happening. It was a fight over the land, you know, and people were at times fighting for their survival. Um, so that really was a narrative that people were very comfortable with um, in some ways until about as we move towards federation and then you see this sort of change about you know it's this successful agricultural you know free colony you know um where everyone's equal and you know there's this mm. new narrative that sort of then takes over from you know the 1890s towards federation and and then keeps going and it's really only in the 1970s and early 80s that uh, you see people like Henry Reynolds writing, a, you know, like The Other Side of the Frontier, frontier which was a sort of a, uh, a watershed moment mm. um, that these histories begin emerging. Of course, at the same time, you've got Aboriginal people who are carrying these stories in their families yeah. as, you know, oral testimony, but sure. they don't reach the public. So it's, it's only in really the last 50 years that I think um, you see this narrative re-emerging. The the Aboriginal population. This is just from a, a, a quick scan of the internet. But the inter, the Aboriginal population declined by eighty four percent after British colonisation. The Maori population in New Zealand by fifty seven. The Canadian First Peoples population by seventy five percent. I don't want to draw you on what the moniker means, but in, especially in this week with everything that goes on. But surely it only serves to remind us of of bloody brutal colonial genocide at this stage doesn't it <laughs> well not only that i think i mean when you roll off those figures um a lot of people obviously died from introduced diseases mm -hmm. um so not all of that um population decimation is due to uh colonial violence i think it's important to state that um obviously the death of the queen um, is a moment for 
um, many nations to reflect on her and many nations have a high regard for her. Um, the institution of the, you know, crown um, has been a detrimental effect on Indigenous people, not just in Australia, but in other places. And Aboriginal people have resisted that uh, becoming British subjects and then resisted the occupation of their lands, which has been a very um, conscious activity of the British Crown to accumulate wealth and build the empire. So the Queen herself is a very contemporary individual um, and we can't put all of these things at her feet um, because that would be inaccurate. But the British Empire, which she is the head of, certainly is responsible for a lot of this. But not only the British Empire, the modern Australian state, because although the occupation, the British occupation of Australia began with, you know, the British Empire and the colonial office, it was ended by modern Australian governments, the colonial governments of Queensland, South Australia, you know, which included the Northern Territory and Western Australia. So, yes, the, it, it, but you're right, it does throw up um, this opportunity to reflect on our connection with the empire and where we're at now, absolutely. I can only wish for a better world where, where Jack Charles was on the cover of all the newspapers and is considered for our money more so than the other child. So um, that would be a better place, I think. As, as Rachel Perkins, and for those of you listening to this, I did the bunny ears then, as Rachel Perkins, mm -hmm. producer of, you know, landmark works like Marbo and First Contact and First Australians and a very vocal activist and advocate and daughter of one of our nation's most celebrated Indigenous leaders, do you feel a responsibility to, to, to be the teller of these stories? Will, will, will this story get told if if you don't do it in, in your own unique way and, and attached way? Oh, yes. And look, this isn't the first time, you know, these stories have been told. Mitch Torres has told the story of Jandamara in the Kimberley, who was a, you know, a resistor, and others have told elements of this story. It's certainly not unique to me. And... Uh, yes, I think if it wasn't me, it would have been done by someone else, an Indigenous filmmaker. And I think this is, you know, just a part of, I mean, it's a, it's a big piece of work. Um, it tries to have a national focus, um, but it's certainly not the first time it's been attempted and it won't be the last, you know. This is a big story. Mm. It needs to be presented in all its complexity. And really this series... You know, it's only three hours of television. It can't possibly encapsulate the, the breadth and the richness of this story. So there's a lot more stories to come. Mm. I'm going to break the rule of interviewing 101 here. I'm going to talk about myself for a moment. Um, <laughs> as a 55-year-old white middle-class male, um, I watched this, of course, sickened and, and um, just shocked by the the accounts that you that you put forward, but also I became very angry that I realised for all of my education, and I'm quite educated for for want of a better word, this element of education and this element of my country's history is was hidden from me. I I it was never offered up in in the retelling of the first two hundred years of of this nation, and um and that made me really upset. I got very angry that that the establishment had deemed that this wasn't worth telling. And, and I guess part of your, your plan with this, this series is to, to maybe start to change that narrative a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a really um, appropriate way to feel, can I say. Um, and I didn't learn this at school either. And people of our generation just haven't. It's been absent. And I think that is great. The, that that is a reason why people don't necessarily understand the aspirations of Aboriginal people because they don't understand their history, you mm -hmm. know. And I think that's the thing we need, you know, the study of history is to learn from it, right? So, and certainly our intention is that this will go into schools and we've designed um, with Culture is Life um, some really beautiful educational resources to support teachers um, to, you know, uh, 
be able to transmit this material to students in a sort of a safe and um, appropriate way. So those educational resources were there. We know that this will go into schools because First Australians, another documentary series that we did was taken up really with great enthusiasm. So I hope that's the same. But yes, I think it's it, the fact that this history has been totally eradicated from from Australians' general knowledge mm. is a, a great shame. And if you look at other countries, you know, like Aotearoa, New Zealand, you know, uh, or South Africa, you yeah, know, Africa, yeah. America to a lesser degree, but they've, they've come to terms with their history. We just, we just haven't got there yet, yeah. you know, but I, I have hope that we will, you know. We're all hopeful, I know. You, you You start the series on the steps of the Australian War Memorial and, and you give them some of the final words and certainly no disrespect intended, of course. But is it enough for the War Memorial bosses to say, look, it's not in our charter to address war on our soil? Look, I think this is a tricky one. So for people who haven't seen the documentary yet, um, we begin it and, as you say, end it at the Australian War Memorial and we pose the question that, you know, if and Henry Reynolds quite eloquently says, you know, this must be a war because it's about the sovereignty of the nation. It's people fighting for their land and their livelihoods. For Indigenous Australians, at the very least, this was a war. It might not be about, you know, it shouldn't be about how it was fought. It mm. should be about what it was fought over, these big questions. And he thinks, and I agree with him, that the big questions that this war was fought over make it war. It's legitimately a number of wars. So the question is therefore then, well, should it be in the Australian War Memorial? Mm. Um, now, the Australian War Memorial was originally set up because all of the wars that Australian Defence Forces had served in had been overseas, so they had nowhere to sort of mourn, you know, those people who died in the war. So it's like a, it's a place where you can go where you can't go to your, the grave of your loved ones. Mm. Um, and the War Memorial has changed. You know, it didn't, for instance, it it it, uh, it resisted having the Vietnam War in there for a long time. So it will evolve, I think. But at the moment, it's not <laughs> evolving on this no. issue. And it is saying that, yes, they acknowledge frontier warfare happened, but uh, they say that their act, their legislation, does not um, include it. Now... It's a very narrow reading of the Act. Um, obviously, the Act could be changed. Um, very, very straightforward legislative change. But I think that, you know, my view is that it should either include frontier warfare or the Australian wars, the wars that created the modern Australian state, or it should rename itself. Because how can it call itself the Australian War Memorial when it doesn't include the legitimate warfare that happened on our country, yeah. about our country. You know, it should call itself the Memorial for Wars Overseas. <laughs> oh, yes, catchy title. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah catchy uh, title. Exactly. I did suggest yeah. that to him, uh, but he... Um, of I'll put it to the board, he said, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess finally, what, I would, what most struck me about the series is its, it's depiction of, of the degree of grief from from whether it's the academic sitting at the, the the big shiny desks that you talk to right down to the the elders who keep the oral histories alive there's this there's this degree of grief that has just burdened generations of indigenous people and that the actions of a a century ago still sort of echo in the descendants of the victims how can that be reconciled how do we ease the indigenous population suffering well, I think that, you know, being heard is the first step, isn't it? Acknowledgement and being heard. I know that, you know, after making First Australians, you know, I carried, oh, that took six years, you know, and it was some grim records there. And this has taken four years and you carry that around with you. But just personally, once it gets out there and is heard, you feel better just by that process. Mm. Um, that's the starting point. That's just that's just where we begin, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, if I can bring it into today, that addresses these things. It addresses truth-telling, it addresses treaty-making, 
and it addresses the fact that Aboriginal people want some recognition in the founding document of this modern state. You know, we don't want to be just ignored <laughs> anymore. We want the modern document that defines Australia to take into consideration the deep history of our existence here. And that form is as a voice that would give advice to parliament on indigenous issues. So that is the next step, you know, we can't just say, okay, we've, we know this now, we've heard this, that's it. You know, there needs to be a resolution between the Australian state on behalf of the Australian people and Indigenous people. This needs to come to some formal resolution process and um, that will be part of the answer to your question. Rachel Perkins, you've made an astonishing um, TV series with the Australian Wars. It's on SBS and SBS On Demand and NITV. Um, from this week onwards. Thank you so much for talking to me on screen watching. It's always a joy. Thank you. Pleasure.